Okay, you can be seated. I'm sorry. Need some friends. All right. Oh. Um, well, thank you so much for coming again, and uh, I, uh, I, I'll tell you, I was just blessed by last night by itself, and it's just amazing that we're going to get to hear several more, so I'm really looking forward to it. It's going to go by fast, but uh, make sure that you do the best you can to make it to every one of these, because I'll tell you what, there's just gold nuggets all over the place, and I just, um, I've just been blessed already, so um, my, my family and I are going to sing a special at this time, and uh, then... Uh, Brother Hummel, you can come.
We talk about mental health and the sadness of our world and those who are contemplating suicide. They're lonely. Uh, their hearts are filled with grief and depression. They have no hope. So when we approach any kind of sound mind, biblical health, uh, we're, we're looking at this from, from God's point of view. And he's given us his precious word. And just as they say, Jesus is enough, and his word is sufficient, his word is enough. And there's all kinds of counseling techniques and so forth that we can use to help an individual refocus. But the bottom line is we must somehow steer their minds, their hearts, back to God. Yes. God is the only one that can give true calmness of spirit, peace of mind. It's the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace. This is what the world's looking for. Yes, yes, yes. And even as the world cries out for unity and inclusivism and, and everybody should not attack, you know what they're actually wanting? They are desiring what God has already promised. When we get to the new earth, I mean, have you ever thought about what it's going to be like? There's no devil. He's locked up. There's no flesh, new uncorruptible flesh. There's no world. We have a new world. It's going to be wonderful. There'll be no cause or reason to sin. And it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful time. Amen. Again, what the world is looking for is what God has promised us. But, the simplicity of the gospel message, repent, believe in Christ, receive, we must believe that we're not good enough to attain that ourselves. But we trust that it's this free gift of God. I must believe I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. God sent Jesus to pay the penalty for our sins. And if we just truly accept that, then, maybe even on this earth, temporarily for these short 60, 70, or for some of you 80, 90 years, we struggle on this earth. But in heaven, oh, it'll go on forever, okay? All right. So what we're going to look at today is this concept, the battle of the mind. And when we talk about mental health, obviously we want to have a godly, sound mind. And we want to be able to somehow, by the power and the grace of God, control our minds. The battle of the mind is the greatest discipline that we will ever face in our entire lives. Why? Because we are not what we think we are, but we are what we think. Your thoughts are nothing more than an index to your character. If you give me all your thoughts for the last three weeks, I can write a biography about you. Because what we think, we are. Our minds, our hearts. Because we don't do until we think about it. You do what you do because you think what you think. And you think what you think because you love what you love. And it really comes down to, man, if we want to be sound in our minds, we must love our God and love our wives and love our kids, yeah? Love our ministries. Ladies, it means you're going to love your God. You're going to love your husband, those of you who are married. And you're just going to love others. So we think what we, th we do what we do because we think what we think. We don't want to automatically do something without thinking about it. <coughs> but we think about what we love the most. So if you want to know where your heart is, examine your thoughts. Mm -hmm. And you will know where you are. So the battle of the mind. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 4.23, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Let's say that together, please. Ready? Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. The word keep is a military term, and it means to guard, to be a sentry, to constantly be watching. <clears throat> Again, your heart is the real you. It's not what men think you are. It's what God knows you to be. It is made up of your mind. It's made up of your will. It's made up of your emotions. Your heart is the real you. Now this morning, we're just going to take one aspect of that. And we're going to take the mind, okay? Out of it, everything that we have in life comes forth for the way we think. So, we're going to study the art of medieval warfare. Now, probably all the pictures I think of the castles here, I've had the privilege to take personally. Most of them were in Austria or Germany or something like that. And so we're going to go way, way back to the 13th and 14th century. And it was interesting that the way they fought then was actually in biblical proportion because it was the way they fought back in Solomon's day and David's day. And there's some wonderful, wonderful truths. We're going to study how the battle of the mind, the concept of 
guarding your heart. The knights, keep committed to pleasing your Lord and King. The enemy, keep a proper view of the enemy. The castle, keep the enemy as far away as possible. And the weapons, keep constantly prepared. Now, I know many of you like to take notes, and this is wonderful, but I have sent all the PowerPoints to the pastor. He can email them all to you. You can have everything you see on the screen you can't get from him, right? That's you right. said you're only going to charge him 10 bucks a piece or something That's like right. that, right? Okay, very good. <laughs> In regards to the knights, okay, understanding that uh, something's not working for me back here, okay? I'm just missing here. There we go. Thank you. Keep committing to pleasing your Lord and King. Now, for you little guys, do you realize that back in the 16th century, most teenagers, most kids didn't even get to go to school? You say, oh, that would be wonderful. No, we don't want to stay dumb our whole lives, right? So it's good to go to school. It's good to learn. Back then, it was only the noblemen's sons that could go. And normally, when they were very, very young, they were called pages. And uh, then after they got to about 13 or 14, they were considered squires. A squire would come into the castle, and he would be training underneath the knight. Now, the squire, in exchange, he would take care of his horse, take care of his equipment. he have to go to school. Constant, constant exercise. It was just a lot of discipline, okay, a lot of learning. If the young squire could somehow make it all the way through his teen years to the age of 21, at that point, if he passed all the discipline and all the exercises into training, he then would be able to come before him, off times uh, in the big banquet halls, and he would come and he would kneel before the king. The king then would take his sword and he would touch both shoulders, dubbing him to become a knight. As he did so, this young squire was simply saying that, I pledge my life to you, my lord and my king. I will live for you, I will fight for you, I will die for you. If we are ever to be victorious in the battle of our minds, we must be committed to pleasing our Lord and King. Yes. This is so important. Because we can become behavioral scientists and we can change behavior to make a person feel better about themselves. Mm -hmm. But the motivation doesn't change. It has to be the motivation. Why do we do what we do? If we're motivated just because I feel better about myself, I look better in front of other people, I, 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 that's a selfish motivation. But if my motivation is I want to please God and I want to be a blessing to the people that I love, loving God and others, God and others, that's called the Shema, okay, in the Hebrew world. So therefore, being pleased, wanting to please our Lord and King, Proverbs 16, 3, commit thy works unto the Lord and thy thoughts shall be established. Now what does that mean? Stay busy. The thing that kills us is free time. The thing that kills teenagers is free time. That's when they get in more trouble when they want to do, you know, five hours of video games a day and so forth. So keep busy. Uh, teach you. you know, when you have kids and grandkids, they should be, you know, make sure they're busy with chores and they're taking piano lessons and guitar lessons, even clarinet lessons. You know the difference between a clarinet and a lawnmower? You can tune a lawnmower. Okay, anyway. <laughs> keep them busy. When our counselors come to the wilds to work there for a summer, oh, they are constantly with their campers and listening to services and playing the games and the activities from morning till night. It goes from Monday morning all the way till Saturday around 11 o'clock. Oh, by the time they get a break, they're like too tired to sin. So all they want to do <laughs> is do their laundry, eat some pizza, take a nap and get to do it again. That's a wonderful way to live. It's kind of what Adam did. I want to do forever what Adam did in the Garden of Eden. And remember, when this is all over, God is in a way bringing back Eden, that perfect environment. Yes. What did Adam do? Yes, yes. He worked, he kept the garden, and he walked with God in the cool of the day. That's why I love living in New England, because the cool of the day is all day long. Okay. <laughs> he worked, and he walked with God. He worked, and he walked with God. Psalm 1914, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. What we say is directly linked to what we think. And we want both of them to be pleasing in God's sight. Yeah. And if that is so, we'll find that 
Keeping our thought life God conscious helps us to be committed to our Lord and King. Isaiah 26.3 That will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Whose mind continuously thinks about our wonderful, wonderful Lord. Okay? That's why I've written so many books on meditation as we'll see in this message. This is the key to having a strong mind. So keep your thought life God conscious. Number two. And again, let's see, did anything change back there with the clicker? Uh, can I just maybe move? You know, no offense, but your head might be blocking it. Doesn't that make you <laughs> <laughs> Okay, you can, you're good. You don't have to, could you, you mind going underneath the table? That might <laughs> Still not doing it, okay? Let me just pull this out and try that. You got it. I'm not sure, you probably... Okay, is that me? Yeah. Very good. All right, we're back. Okay. Number two, keep a proper view of the enemy. As we know, if we want to encourage ourselves to have a sound mind, but we want to help other people really struggling with this, wow, we have to admit that there's an enemy out there. Yeah, right. And the enemy, obviously, our arch enemy is Satan. He hates everything that God is for. And he tries to keep God's children as far away from him as he possibly can. Keep a proper view of the enemy. During the Dark Ages, and that's what it was called, the Dark Ages, in some ways we're getting back to that again. Back in that day, I mean, mercenaries could be hired to come in and totally annihilate an entire nation or entire village. And sadly, they would come in, somewhat times they go into a village and begin killing men and literally taking their heads and put them on sticks and fasten it to the castle wall. They're called pikes. Just to show others we are now in control. It was vicious, it was barbaric. In thinking of what sometimes the enemy, they, they oft times uh, would put them in, in gallows or sometimes they'd wrap them in chains and lift them high above the wall. It was just so cruel. And it used to be that I'd have to go in detail explaining, but all you have to do is watch the news now to Ukraine and yes. understand some of the same yes, yes, yes. just atrocities that are going on where there's absolutely no respect for human life. It's animalistic. It's people seeking to just satisfy their cravings without any concern. Any concern for anyone or anything else. The enemy. We've got to view thoughts as sin. Sometimes we think as long as we don't do it, we're okay. But even the evil thoughts themselves we must view as sin. Sin. Romans 12, 9, abhor that which is evil and cleave to that which is good. Genesis 6, 5, we saw this verse last night. God saw the wickedness on the earth. This was right before the flood. That it was great. It all covered the earth. What was the wickedness? The imagination of their heart was only evil continually. They had wicked and selfish thought lives. Psalm 36, 4. The Bible says he devises mischief on his bed. Now, if you counsel anyone, one of the most difficult times for people is late at night, dark, when they're going to sleep. And their minds just start going out of control, thinking things they shouldn't. But it tells us why, at the end of that verse, he devises mischief on his bed, because he abhorreth not evil. Because we don't hate sin. Proverbs 6, 16, and 18, these six things that the Lord hates, yea, seven are an abomination to him. You know what one of them is? A heart that devises wicked imaginations. God despises and hates a wicked mind. 2 Corinthians 10, 5, casting down imaginations of things we imagine and think about, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. I love this verse where it says, casting down. I used to think of Daniel Boone. Remember Daniel Boone was a man, just, and he had Boonesboro. And when he was attacked by the Indians, sometimes they would be climbing up these ladders, and they'd take their gun and push and go, ah! Okay? You cast down the imagination. What does that mean? Every thought that goes against what we know about God. Okay? Here's your mind. Okay? Here's some of your minds. But here's your mind. Here's your knowledge you got. Does God hate the trash uh, that's online today in the dark side? Yeah, we know that. And I'm being very careful the words I use because we have little ears in here, okay? And so God hates that. So all of a sudden, you're online, 
Maybe you're at a bookstore, you're watching TV, and you're seeing something you should. You're tempted. You think, I know God hates this, but I really want to watch it. But I know God hates it. I don't care. And you exalt that thought above, which you already know about God. This is the problem, and when we when we don't view evil thoughts as sin, we're going to get in trouble. I used to say, all you need to do is hang with me two weeks, and you'll learn how to hate sin. Because much of my life is counseling, and I'm sitting with a second counselor, I never counsel alone anymore, but a second counselor and a teenager who have been abused in every way you can imagine. And I'm telling you folks, when you have to listen to this over and over, your heart gets very, very angry against yeah. sin. And you learn to hate it, okay? It's not just a part of society. It is evil. So number two, make sure we keep a proper view of the enemy and hate sin. Number three, keep the enemy as far away as possible. If you want to have a healthy mind, you need to make sure you protect yourself. You moms do this in your homes, I'm sure already, but the concept of building a castle, they would first of all would find a hill or mountain and they could clear cut the wood 360 degrees, sometimes up to a mile away. So that way from the castle, you look around, the enemy could not get there. If somehow the enemy could sneak across the open fields at night, you can't see it in this picture, but around most castles there was a what? A moat. And what is a moat? It's a wide, deep ditch filled with water and things are very undesirable to human beings. Alligators, crocodiles, electric eels, and English teachers. They would put them <laughs> inside the moat, okay? Now, the only way to get across the moat was the drawbridge. And I hope you don't think that you can just ride up and your horse reach down and put the, hit your button on the garage door opener. Okay. The garage door can only be opened from one place. Where? Inside. Inside. Did you know that nobody can make us sin? Nobody. There's nowhere in the Bible that says that Satan can make us sin. No parents can make us sin. No individual can make another individual sin. You know why we sin? We sin because we choose to. Now, there's pressures, there's reasoning, but still, we sin because we choose to. We drop that drop it. We double-click on that icon. We choose to use those words. We sin. Behind the drawbridge often was a series of gates. And there would be a metal gate, lattice work like iron. There would be a wooden gate. Most of the wooden gates, by the way, were covered with very thick leather. So if they were under attack, they could soak the leather with water so the flaming arrows, when it went into it, would extinguish them. The castle walls, some of them were wide enough to get two or three chariots racing side by side. And they had these towers every so often. Now, the tower, I've been in them. They're very, very narrow. And they're windy steps. Most people are right-handed. And with a the sword, they're too narrow. You couldn't even fight. But you could always defend it from the inside. On top of the castle walls was a part that you see comes up and comes down like this. It's called the battlement. Now, from the outside, I'm telling you, it's very narrow. But from the inside, did you know it slanted on both ways? Mm -hmm. So that way, the archer could look either way. Inside the castle walls was a courtyard, well, lit, well guarded at all times. Inside the courtyard, there was almost like a castle within a castle. Does anybody know what it was called? It was called the keep. Keep your heart with all diligence. Mm -hmm. Inside this inner castle is normally where they kept the king and the queen, uh, the food sources, and sometimes the ammunition and all that kind of stuff. Why? Why would they go through all of this trouble to build a castle. Very simply, to keep the enemy as far away as possible. Job 31.1. We know about Job, a righteous man. Job said, I have made a covenant with mine eyes. I have made a, a promise with mine eyes. Why then should I think about a young maid or, or a young maid or a girl? He struggled with his thought life. Psalm 101.3. I think most of you know it. Let's quote it together out loud. Ready? I will say no wicked thing before my eyes. I keep going. I hate the work of the Turk side. It shall not clean up him. Thank you, Pastor. But some of the rest of us couldn't do it, could we? Now, I'm your friend. 
And I came all the way from New Hampshire to be a blessing to you. But I think we just revealed to ourselves part of our own problems. We know about the word, but we don't really know it well. We know what preachers have said to us for years. I'll say, no one can think before my eyes. Why? Well, because we've never looked at the verse, the whole verse, the whole context of the chapter, because we've never thought about each one. What is the next? I hate to work at them, the goal side. You say, Rand, I'm not doing it. I'm not the one performing this. Other people, I hate to work with others that are side. And when it comes to the battle of the mind, do you understand people involved in, in an industry of the dark side of the internet? They're people with souls. They're somebody's daughters and sons. It's kind of hard to try to get your joys off of something that you know these people, if they probably don't know the Lord, and they'll probably spend eternity in hell. You know you can't pray for somebody and lust after them at the same time. Interesting. We're going to look at 2 Peter in a little bit. Proverbs 4.25, let thine eyes look right on. Now some of you are old enough to remember back when we were in the 60s and 70s, right on. Okay, a little bit different here. <laughs> let thine eyes look right on. Don't be shifty-eyed. And in our world today, you don't even have to be shifty-eyed. All you have to do is turn the TV on or walk into a mall and you're in trouble, Okay. Avoid stimulants and provisions for the flesh. This is why the castle was built. And, and many times when I have to go into a family situation to counsel a kid that's considering suicide, I promise you, one of the major reasons is often his guilt because he's heavily involved in some form of immorality. He feels guilty, he's ashamed, he doesn't want other people to know about it. Maybe the best way to get out of this is, and then they start thinking these very, very negative thoughts. So what we need to do, which goes right along with the message tomorrow morning, not the first Sunday school message, the second one, is called guardrails to help our younger ones from ever getting to that point, okay? And we do need guardrails in life. So avoid stimulants, provisions for the flesh. Number three. The weapons keep constantly prepared. I don't know if you've ever studied about medieval times, but it's a very interesting study. And some of their war machines and their weaponry was incredible. They had catapults that would hurl uh, big rocks against the castle walls and try to break the mortar. They had a thing called a trebuchet. And it literally was like a sling that would hurl diseased cattle or even things on fire inside over the walls, okay? Uh, they had these guys called sappers. Now, a sapper literally was a tunneler, and they would sneak across the open fields at night. They would get to the edge of the moat, and they would begin digging down and digging across to try to come right up and do a tunnel right in the courtyard. But if they didn't engineer it right, all of a sudden they broke through. Here comes all the water, the alligators, and the English teachers, and then they were in trouble again. <laughs> um, they, they had a thing called a belfry. This belfry, oftentimes even bigger than this, the base of it in this room, but a big, big wooden wheels on the sides and a series of ramps and ladders. You could put over 100 soldiers in it and they push it up against the edge of the moat and then on top of it, 75 feet high, they drop their own drawbridge on top of the castle wall. They had the most incredible amount of weaponry, but they also, they had, it wasn't really a weapon, it was more of a tactic, okay? It was called siege. Most of you remember what this is all about. They would surround the castle and do everything they can to try to starve the people so they couldn't get any food in. Got it. In the Bible, we read back in the Old Testament about the siege of Samaria. And when you read about this, they were under siege, they were surrounded, and they began to starve to death. The Bible says they could purchase the head of a donkey to cook it and eat it. They would purchase, get this, a fourth part of a cab of doves dung. Fourth part of a cab is about two cups. But then the story goes on. The two moms said, we're going to die. So let's kill and eat your baby today. And tomorrow we'll kill and eat my baby. Because they knew they were going to die. You say, man, I can't even imagine. I understand when a person begins to starve to death, they create the most bizarre appetite. And their mind just goes crazy because they're so hungry. Why do you think we have such appetites in our world today?
for sexual things, for acceptance, mm. for money, wow. for power. Why do we have such intense passion? I think it's because we're starving to death spiritually. Mm -hmm. And we still come to church and we learn from the pastor if we're thinking clearly. Your pastor's been studying all week and Mike's up here preaching away and you're out there going like this and he says, man, they're right with me. And you're thinking, hmm, Outback or Olive Garden? Which one should we go to? <laughs> <laughs> and it's easy to let your mind drift to go away. Yeah. Starting to death spiritually. Some people want to spend some time with God, but they almost look at that as, okay, check. I did my 15 minutes of reading today. That's it. That's it. And they don't, they don't, I, I call it the drive through McDonald's syndrome. You look for something fast and quick and easy. We can drive through, get it done in five minutes, you're on your way. That's how we treat God. That's not feasting and dining with Him. And seriously, as we'll see here in a minute, part of what we need to do in regards to winning this is meditation. And where have I hidden my heart that I might not say the next word? Yes. Sin. Yes. One of the reasons that so many struggle with depression now because they're living in sin. So let's back up a little bit instead of just dealing with that. What can keep me from sinning? That word have I hidden my heart that I might not sin. 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 And yet we still get angry with family members. And don't even stop to memorize a verse about it. <clears throat> that word of them have I hid my heart that I might not sin. And some still struggle with all kinds of lust. And they don't even stop to meditate on scripture that deals with such things. It's crazy. God tells us what to do. We just don't do it. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Philippians 4.8. What sort of things are true? What sort of things are just? What sort of things are pure? What sort of things are lovely? If there be a virtue and praise, think on these things. Psalm 119. Have you ever memorized the whole Psalm 119? Mm -hmm. I've tried a couple times. It keeps repeating itself so much it's a booger to, to memorize. It really is. But what we're going to look at is this. A good example of Psalm 119. Every single one of us are tempted. James teaches us how we're tempted, drawn away of our own desires and lusts and so forth. When temptation comes, the first thing we need to do and we can teach others to do is use it as a springboard to ask God for help. We're all weak. I hope you guys have the idea and teach your friends the idea that when you start to feel depressed or down or angry, Lord, I need you. Lord, I can't do today without you. Lord, I'm scared. I'm angry. I need you today. Immediately, we got to force our thoughts on God. And if somehow God came down to earth today, he says, Mike, I'll give you five minutes with me. Rand, you get five minutes. Miriam, you get five. Everybody gets five minutes, okay? We get our five minutes with God. And we say, here's my biggest struggle. Can you help me? You know what God would say? I can. Open my Bible, too. Everything we need is already in this book, okay? Mm -hmm. And what we do is we ask God to direct us to his word, and then from that we find what's called a weapons verse. Mm -hmm. And what is a weapons verse? Mm -hmm. That's a verse that deals specifically with the problem that we're having. And this is where study and counsel comes in, and all of you can be a big help to your friends. If they're struggling with depression, anxiety, fear, you take them to verses that deal with that. If they're struggling with lust, or, or pride, you take into verses and deal with that. If they're consumed with anger and bitterness, take them to scripture and teach them what it means and meditate on that. Mm -hmm. A weapons verse is a verse that deals specifically with the problem we're having. Any of you guys into hunting here? Got any deer hunters here? Okay, we got a couple, okay? I uh, grew up in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is a deer hunting state, okay? We got a couple others from there. I mean, even the women grow beards for bucks. I mean, it's crazy. It really is. So I've got some friends that I do hunt with from time to time. I haven't for a couple of years. But, and my wife, she's at home, and she thinks it's so stupid. Okay? She likes eating events. So just don't tell me that you just shot Bambi's cousin or whatever. All right? So you're out there in the woods at 5.15 a.m. You're freezing. It's cold. you got to go to the bathroom. You're not even allowed to shoot until 7, 18 a.m., okay? But you have to be in your tree stand or you have to be there ready to go. So 
So when you just think you don't even have fingers or toes because you're so cold, all of a sudden, 715, 718, 725, 732, here it comes. You slowly you turn your head, here it comes. A 78 point buck. <laughs> <laughs> He's coming towards you and you're ready. You went to Walmart the night before, you reach down, you pick up your sweeper soaker and you pump it six times, you know, and you pull the trigger. Now is the super soaker going to take out a 78 point buck? <laughs> no. And neither are we attempting to fight the second most powerful force in all the universe. Mm -hmm. Satan is not afraid of us. And ways we can figure out to do this and do that. No, 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 no. We need the very word of God. He's not afraid of us, but he is afraid of God. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the demoniac in the garden, or in, in Gadara? They called the nude dude in the rude mood. Do you remember that guy? <laughs> All right? When Jesus shows up, these demons are scared to death. And they're begging him not to do certain things, begging Jesus. Why? They've already met him before. He cast them out of heaven. They have to listen to God. Mm -hmm. So that's why when temptation comes, you immediately take them to the word of God. That's what Jesus did when Satan went after him. The first thing is memorize. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin. Say it with me. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. How many of you believe that verse is true? Let me see your hands like sweet. Okay. I'm almost done. How about we'll take a couple of you. Uh, I'll point to you and I want you to stand uh, if you can and then just share one or two of the verses that you've been memorizing your personal devotions the last couple of weeks because I promise whatever you're memorizing will be a great blessing to others, okay? I'll we'll start with, uh, hmm, everybody's looking away from me all of a sudden. <laughs> I'm not going to call on anyone, but folks, it's the main reason why we struggle. We've got to memorize. It's almost like the old cowboy. When the enemy came, he was a quick draw. You've got to have the Word of God. Maybe you don't have your Bible or your phone with you right then, but it's so in your mind that the second dad, your kids, your wife says something, does something, it's just, ah, it's okay, okay, swift to hear, so to speak, so to wrath, the wrath of man, but it doesn't work the righteousness of God. So things are true and this is not kind. Okay, Lord. So the word of God just creeps in real quickly and stops you from saying or doing something that you wouldn't want to do. Meditate. I will meditate in thy precepts and have respect into thy ways. How many of you live in a farm? Let me see your hands. Okay. How many have ever been on a farm? How many ever say old McDonald had a farm? <laughs> <laughs> so pastor, you're make it real easy. I grew up working on a farm. The girl cows, those ones we get the milk from, you know, the white ones you get white milk and the black ones chocolate milk and all that. <laughs> they get up early in the morning, they get the grain, they eat the grass, and then the way God made cows is they, they ruminate. We say they chew their cut. And so if they eat at 6 in the morning and swallow it, and they get hungry at 10 o'clock, they just take that same food and burp it back up into their mouth and chew it up again. <laughs> swallow it and put it in a different stomach. They get hungry again at 2 o'clock. Same food, puke it back up in their mouth, chew it up again, swallow. Now, ladies, aren't you glad that God made cows like cows and not men like cows? Because we could be sitting here right now, this morning, and you're saying, I wonder how long the ram's going to go. I'm getting a little hungry. You guys are thinking this. And I go, oh, yeah, honey, that cherry. And bring it back up. <laughs> we don't do that. But the reason a cow does is she wants to chew it over and over and over and over and over to get every nutrient out of it. That's meditation. Mm. I normally like to take at least 45 minutes a verse. And I do a word study. And I know I have my computer with different Bible programs. I'll do word studies. Uh, I'll do a grammatical check. I'll read some commentary. I, I want to know. Now this is, it's not just part of what I do in my work, but this is my hobby. This is my love, okay? For instance, if you truly want to learn how to meditate, should be lightest, consumers, controls. Taking notes, got it? Good, let's go on, all right? <laughs> this book of law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe, say just the next two words with me, please. To do. To do. According to it's all written therein. How do we hope those who are struggling with all kinds of fear and depression do right? Meditate. 
teach them to meditate on the very words of God. You say, but Rand, I want to be prosperous. I want to be successful. God will take care of that. Then thou shalt make that way prosperous, and then you'll have good success. The key is learning to think and meditate on the word of God. Now, if you're truly a man, that means when you take your wife to the mall, you like to at least wear Sears and look at the tools, or now you go to Ace Hardware, okay? So you have to have the right toolbox. First of all, in our toolbox, we need your Bible. God wrote a book. All scripture is given by what? Inspiration. And what does that mean? God, God, God breathed. God breathed. Very good. What does God breathe mean? Inspiration. Okay. All right. Let me help you. I'm going to pretend you're kids at camp. Everybody take your hand and put it in front of your mouth. Ready? I want you to repeat after me. Peter picked. A pack of pickled peppers. Pickle How many pickled peppers did Peter Piper pick? Pickle pepper, Peter Piper pick. Did you feel that? Did you smell that? Okay, <laughs> you, you cannot speak without breathing out. And God breathed out these words. And then he told his friends like Moses and David and Jeremiah and Matthew and John and Paul to write them down for us. And it's what we call the word of God. Amen. And everything, we, this is God's love letter to us. You say, but Rand, when I study it, I don't always understand it. Then get yourself a study Bible to help you understand. Yes. There's many of them out there to do comparative readings and comparative studies. Uh, number three, word study helps. I probably own every kind of word study program there is. I love doing word studies. Because words change over the years, okay? And as you study and see why they were used at that time, it really, really opens up scripture and you get to understand it a little bit more, okay? It kind of goes right along with Bible dictionaries. I personally, I have never ever plowed with oxen. I plowed, but not with oxen. I've never fished with a net in the Sea of Galilee. I've been on the Sea of Galilee, but I've never fished in it. I've never gone out to a field to sow. I don't even know how to sew. I hardly even know where to put the thread through the needle. <laughs> now we laugh. But kids today don't grow up in an agrarian world. None of you live in a farm. And so they have no concept of what it means for a man to go out in the field to sow. And much of the, many of the illustrations of scripture are, are agrarian or they're farm based, okay? This is why even a Bible dictionary is so important, like Zondervan, Pictorial, uh, there's, there's many of them out there, okay? This is a biggie, though. Commitment of time. Commitment of time. I don't know how busy your schedules are. Sometimes it seems like we just don't even hardly have enough time to breathe. I understand that. But if we're too busy for devotional time, we're too busy for God. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't make sense, does it? It needs to be, and you say, but Rayla, you need to keep up with the news. Did you know Fox News repeats every 11 minutes? You only need to watch 11 minutes, and then you have another hour and a half to be able to spend with the Lord and read that, okay? It kind of goes along with this one, a set place. I think it's important to have a set place that you meet with God every day. You know you're going to be there. There's no distractions. You've got a place to put your coffee. Uh, hopefully, you don't have a TV in there, so you're not distracted going that. A set place and the simplicity of prayer. Lord, teach me today. Help me to understand this verse. I don't want to leave here without really knowing what you're trying to tell me here, okay? For instance... Meditation. Would you quote this verse together with me? Ready? His own iniquity shall take the wicked himself, and he shall be with the cords of his sins. You say, that's a great verse. Yeah. What does it mean? I have no idea, but it's a great <laughs> verse. Okay, you ready? Let's try it. Grammatically, we have four personal pronouns. His, himself, he, and his. Now, these personal pronouns are pointing towards the subject of the sentence, which is who? Who are we talking? They're referring to what? The okay, the wicked, all right? So, when is a person wicked? Well, there's two words here that kind of point toward that. One is the word iniquity, and the second word is sin. There's iniquity, there's sin, there's trespassers. There's many words in Scripture that deal when we, with when we disobey God. Now, they all have a little different nuance, too. Like in this case, iniquity almost is a non-thinking. 
You ever say something, oh, why did I say that, okay? And then the other sin is in defying God. I could care less what you think. I'm going to do it anyway. But wait, we, we missed a word here. Own iniquity. Your turn. Tell me. Don't make it hard. What does own mean? Raise your hand. What is his own iniquity? Personal. Personal? Give me more. Yours. Okay, yours. Very good. So you have ownership? That's what I was, the word I was going to use was ownership. Maybe ownership? I from you. Good. No. Mine. Mine? Very good. That's great. I own it. It's mine. Somebody else. Keep going. We got a little farther to go here. What? Belong. Belonging to me? Okay, if it belongs to me and it's mine, it's it's pose it's ownership. What why why are we saying that? If it's if it's not mine, then what? I don't own it. Or it's it's somebody else's, okay? So why why do we sin? You know why we sin? Because our kids are wives drive us insane. It's their fault, right? <laughs> yeah. No. It's my sin. Nobody can make you sin. And until we own up to our own weakness and sin, we'll never defeat it. So his own iniquities, now the two words shall take. Now remember when this was written? It was during Solomon's day. And I will tell you ahead of time, I've already studied through this. This is a military term. So he's talking about going into battle here. His own iniquity shall take the wicked. What do you think? What's another way of saying in military terms? Shall take, Seize. conquer. Seize. Somebody else. Seize. Even, what's that? Seize. Seize. Take. Take. Capture. So what happens is the sin and iniquity sneaks in and it captures the wicked himself. Now, back in this day, they didn't want to annihilate him. They didn't want to kill him because they actually would incarcerate them so they could use them for the workforce. They could turn them into slaves. Okay. So, they come, they capture, shall be holden. Well, where did they put prisoners back in those days? What was it called? Dungeon. dungeon. Can you help me? Tell me, what, what do you think about when you think about a dungeon? Dark. 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 Rats. 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 <laughs> what? Mice. Wet. Uh, mice and rats. The rats usually ate the mice. Okay. Wait. Small. Case. Small. Ah, uh, maybe. Cold. Cold. Filthy. Filthy. Okay. Hey, think about it. They didn't give them bathroom breaks, okay? <laughs> and because of that, the rats came. So they don't want you to get out of that dungeon. So that he's going to do one more thing. You're going to be incarcerated in the dungeon, but you're going to be kept there with cords. Mm -hmm. What were they called back in that day? Chains. 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 Shackles. Yeah. So all of a sudden, they capture this guy. They throw him into this basically like a pit. Many of them were literally like a manhole cover, dropping them in. The only light was from that hole up above. And you think, I don't want to be in this filthy, dark, but I'll, so they change, I'll probably die here. I'll never be free. I'll never see my family again. Okay, look at me. What sin has so captured your heart and mind that you've done it over and over and over and over and over again? You want to break free, but you feel like you can't. We live in a world where there's so many addicted to alcohol, they're addicted to drugs, they're addicted to immorality, they're addicted to so many things. They want, I promise you, they want to break free, but they feel like they can't. Okay, you know what we just did for the last seven minutes? We meditated. I gave you a verse that made absolutely no sense seven minutes ago. And now we're sitting here feeling sorry for people that have addictions and maybe struggling in their own heart. That's the power of meditation. It really, really is. Okay? Your turn. Do I have a time limit here? No, you're fine. Okay, good. All right, so you all have your own table, and I want you to talk right at your table. But, and then I'm, I'm only going to give you about 60 seconds for each phrase. And then I'm going to point to different tables, okay? and uh, see what you think. So, would you try to talk amongst yourself, what does this phrase, having eyes full of adultery, mean? Okay? And we'll be very careful with this, but I want us to see what this verse is saying.
okay? Everybody looks this way. And I know you, when you're meditating on yourself, there's no time limits, okay? But again, because of the age sensitivity here, this is the idea of, man, just there's so much out there in our world that's immoral that you can fill your eye gate with, okay? It's out there. So those who choose to fill their eyes, whether it be through the internet or magazines or videos or YouTube, whatever, those who choose to do this, so the filthy stuff, now, talk about this one. They cannot cease from sin. What is this, what is this phrase talking about? They cannot cease from sin. Go for it. Brother Ray, are we talking, talking believers? Technically both. Okay. Believers who are walking with God. Okay, all right, help me out. What do you guys figure out on the back table? Cannot see us from sin. Just what's first thought? Can't focus on anything other than sin. Yeah, okay, very good. Can't focus on anything else. How do you guys do? Said that, so constantly sinning. Just constantly and cannot stop. Um, they don't know God. Okay. So because they don't know God, that maybe the, they don't think they're doing wrong. Maybe, yeah, exactly. They, they don't even see it as wrong. What do you guys see? So in any other way, phrases? Or maybe the same thing? We said couldn't stop even if trying. Even try, couldn't stop? Um, yeah. what, they built an addiction on it. Okay, got the word addiction. Same thing? Same thing. Same, same thing. thing. All right, so you'll see there's a digression here. Once they start thinking evil, then it becomes addictive in their thought process. And have, All right, let's go to the next one, beguiling unstable souls. Now let's get a little bit more tough. Okay, look this way. And let me say this about this verse contextually. Aaron brought it up that this is technically talking about an unbeliever. In context, this verse is talking about unbelievers. But even believers at times can be addicted to certain things like this. So, who can help me? What does beguiling mean? To deceive. To deceive, to trick. It's like, uh, I know we have a super fisherman back here. And every day, you take a bait, throw it into that little pond, you're deceiving. <laughs> Look at me, I will be good, I will be tasty. They never see the hook when you bring it, okay? I saw him down there and he caught a real big one. He actually got snagged in the lake. But anyway, it looked like a big fish. Okay, uh, we got cheating out of is what it means, tricking, deceiving, okay? So understanding sin is a liar and it tells you it will satisfy you. And in some ways it does for a couple of seconds. When you, when you get, especially today with the super souped up fentanyl drugs, it's a super high. But they don't tell you what happens when you come down. And those who get drunk so they have to deal with life, they forget what it's like when they're sober again. And it just is, it's, it's sad. It really is to fall into that trap. So it's a liar. But what does it mean, unstable souls? Unstable. Okay. Unsafe. Go not ahead. necessarily knowing what they're gonna get into. Okay, not what they're, what not, not sure what they're gonna get into. That's good. Okay. Somebody else said something. Inexperienced in the Bible. Inexperienced, sure. Well, that goes. It, well, that is very true. Okay, they're unstable. Somebody else. Wishy washy. Wishy washy. Good way to put it. Referring to a Christian, I think about um, double minded. Okay. Very yeah. Very good. The double minded is unstable in all those ways, according to James. Very good. Anybody else? Okay. Unsteady. 
Unsteady. And I'm glad you said that because when you were real little, like when you were just maybe like 16, 18 months, your mom and dad watched you learn how to walk. Of course, you had some extra clothing there that made it tough anyway, okay? And then as you walked, when you learned that you fell down, then you got back up and you fell down, okay? Uh, <clears throat> when I think of beguiling unstable souls, most of the individuals, I'm going to be careful here again, I have to counsel a lot of addictions to online immorality. Most start at the age of 11. Okay? That's an unstable soul. That's an individual who by reason of use has not made decisions to be able to say no thank you to this kind of trash. And so you have to understand that all this kind of sin, it's attacking the younger and the younger. Did you know Barna Statistics used to say that 75% of people who trust Christ do so before the age of 18? Now they change that to 13. Because this world grabs such a hold of the hearts of kids in their teenage years, okay? All right, let's go to this one. A heart they have exercised with covetous practices. Now that's a good one. You could preach a whole week, a whole month of series on this one. Phrase. Okay, go ahead. Talk about it. Okay, look this way. All right. Uh, okay. Which, uh, give me, which which word or phrase did you guys focus in on? I think um, we actually focused on the last half of the exercise with covetous, those three. Mm -hmm. and when you look at exercise, that's to, to practice something, to, to build yourself up in a way. And then the covetousness side of it would be a ungodly desire, I guess. For sure. You know, kind of a, the terms I was hearing, that's kind of where we were. You know what the Greek word for exercise is? Gymnazo. <laughs> <laughs> well, we get our word gymnasium, it really is. So they're working hard at covetous. Okay, now take the word covetous. Where else in the Bible have you ever heard the word covet? Anybody talk about that? Ten Commandments. What does it say? Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's ox or his donkey. Okay, that's his truck and his car. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's a maid servant and man servant. That's dishwasher and a vacuum cleaner. Okay, <laughs> thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's. What's next? Why? 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 Even if she's in a magazine or a video, sin. The coveting, the desiring that which God never intended you to have. Isn't it amazing how relevant Scripture is on this? Okay, back up. Who, who dealt? Who dealt with the second word? Okay, in what way? The most, in, it's the most personal part of your life. This is a hard issue. I know we're talking about mental health, but remember, as a man thinks his in his heart, and mental health is talking about heart health, <coughs> in the very center of his being. Sometimes in scripture, they, it uses the word bowels of mercies. It's the deepest, most inner. And today, I don't, you know, you wouldn't, guys wouldn't say to your wife, I love you with all my bowels. You don't say it that way. It's I love you with all my heart. Okay? But it's the innermost part of your feeling. So it is a heart issue that they have exercised real hard, desiring that which God knows. You guys, you did ex excellent on that. And then the last one, there are consequences. You can choose your sin, but you can't choose consequences of your sin. So, if you took a verse like that, or the one we talked about before, and you started writing down questions that these verses answer, you start seeing things like this. Do you really want to be a slave to sin? Or, love gives and lust takes. There are no secret sins. And why do you want what God forbid you to have? The root of all sexual sin is selfish pride. Don't be fooled by flattery. She really doesn't want you. You can't beat this all by yourself. 
You're accountable to God himself. Don't just stay away from sin. Stay away from temptation. Your thoughts are an index to your character. Guess what we just did for the last eight minutes? We meditated. How do you help people who struggle with some serious kind of a mental health? You find scripture that deals with the depression, or the anger, or the anxiety, or the fear, okay? Now, I have to say, I've done some work to help you on this, because this is my life, and I spend most of my time online, or on my phone, or now, we, I do a lot of counseling through FaceTime. And so you're sitting, for me, mostly with teens, but not always, because I'm a camp director, it works well. Pastors and youth pastors call me all the time, and I deal with them, because they don't know who to talk to. If a pastor and his wife's having major problems, do so they go to their head deacon? Pretty soon they're out of the church. And so I understand they need someone to talk to. So what I have done, and you'll see the books back there. By the way, just so you please, this has nothing to do with selling books. Because every penny of every book that's ever sold that I write goes right to the Wild Ministry. I don't get money from them, okay? And that's on purpose. That's the way I want it. So you take the first one, lest you fall, Meditations of Fight, War, and Purity. How do you keep away from the porn world? How do you keep away from that kind of wickedness? Turn away wrath. Meditations to control anger and bitterness. And this anger is, it's enslaving. An angry man, he wishes he wasn't that way, but he is controlling him. Fear not. Meditation is to overcome fear, worry, and discouragement. Now, I know when I wrote that, I needed to do a lot of study because I'm not really given into fear. The, you know, the, the anger, I grew up an angry guy. I knew how to write that one. And so I found out that moms are pretty fearful. And they worry. I mean, my wife used to make my son put a bicycle helmet on, just go out and feed the dog. I mean, I understand that, okay? <laughs> but today, parents wrap their kids in bubble wrap before they send them to camp. So I understand there's worry there. The latest one I wrote is called Stress Less, Trust More. Meditations to Manage Stress and Anxiety. Oh, I don't know. I, oh, my life's out of control. I'm so scared. And you know what God says? He says this. Would, would you just look at those flowers out there? how beautiful they are. They don't toil. They don't work hard. I made them that beautiful. God says, I want you to become a bird watcher. God's a bird watcher. Consider the fowls of the air. Mm -hmm. they, don't, they don't toil. They don't, they don't have to. He takes care of them. And the whole Sermon on the Mount is just so, okay, take a breath. Calm down. It's going to be okay. Take no thought. He says that many times. So if I'm counseling somebody that's just so, so stressed and they're fearful and uh, they're fearful of the end of the world coming, uh, even if they're fearful for night financial things, you help them with a budget, but then you show them, say, don't pray and ask God for money. Thank God ahead of time for explaining what you need when you need it. You go to Proverbs 30 where it says, Lord, give me just enough food convenient. Not too much. Because if I have 15 million in the bank, I'll stop praying. It's there. Not too much or I'll forget about you. Not too little or I'll forsake you. I'll go and get a third job so I can get everything paid for. I'll take it in my own hands. Lord, give me just enough. Mm -hmm. Now, what I just shared with you are simple Bible truths that can calm the heart of someone that's really, really struggling, okay? And then a right side up attitude and an upside down world. That's basically what the Sermon on the Mount is. Philippians, fourfold secret of outrageous, contagious joy. How can you really have true joy? Well, I encourage somebody struggling with joy to do this. I want you to read the book of Philippians once a day for 30 days. It only takes about 12 to 14 minutes to read it. Every day for 30 days. And I just had a guy two days ago say, Rand, I've been doing this. It is amazing. It really is. You say, I don't have time. Then read Philemon. It only takes a minute and 45 seconds to go through Philemon, okay? Um, the book of Joseph. Oh, he was such an example for us. Titus. Um, how to live a God-centered life in a very self-centered world. Paul said, Titus, go to the island of Crete. It's filled with criminals and pirates and vacationers. They are hedonistic. They don't want to do anything but please themselves. 
I want you to go there and teach them how to be God-centered. And that's what the whole book is about. So every book of the Bible has a certain thought and a certain theme. And so if you're working with somebody and say, hey, let's do this, you both get one. And you work it by yourself. And then you meet at a coffee shop. Now, it used to be you go to McDonald's and get a Coke. Now you mortgage your house and go to Starbucks and get, and get a latte, okay? But you meet once a week or once every other week and share what you're both learning. The little booklet that I showed you, uh, let's go here. So if you're a dad and you have sons that are just coming of age, we'll say, you get it lest you fall. You both read it. Moms, you take a daughter that's kind of worried. She's, you know, she's 14 and she knows she'll probably never be married and she's scared and you get to fear not. You read it separately. You don't read it to them. Read it separately. And then you go out for, for a date and you just sit down. Mom, what would you get from this one? Hey, Dad, what does this mean to you? But you both share what you've learned. That's called mentoring, discipling. But you do this with the hurting people in your life. Now, I know if you work, like some of you work in the mental health industry, you're limited in the industry until they ask you. Boy, how if they ask you, that's when you set up the coffee shop date, okay? So you can just sit down and share with them. And it's not accusatory. If they ask you a hard question, you say, oh, that's a great question. I don't know. Let's meet again next Tuesday night, and I'll have an answer for you. And automatically you're there. Now, there's a couple things. Number one, the power of the Word of God is transforming their lives. But number two, they have a friend who cares enough to meet with them an hour a week. Wow. That's the key, isn't it? So, keep your heart with all diligence. Guard your heart. For out of it are every issues of life that we face. The battle of the mind is the greatest discipline we'll ever face in our life. But if we're to help people spiritually, heartfelt, mentally, we've got to take them to our wonderful Lord. Okay? Let's pray. Father, thank you for these